Good morning. My name is Virtus Robinson, and I'm the ministerial intern for the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. My pronouns are he, him. Our opening words this morning come from The Circle of Grace, a book of blessings for the seasons. It is entitled, Beloved is Where We Begin by Jan Richardson. If you would enter into the wilderness, do not begin without a blessing. Do not leave without hearing who you are, beloved. Named by the one who has traveled this path before you, do not go without letting it echo in your ears. If you find it hard to let it into your heart, do not despair. That's what the journey is for. I cannot promise this blessing will be free from danger, from fear, from hunger or thirst, from the scorching of the sun or the fall of the night. But I can tell you that on this path, there will be help. I can tell you that on this way, there will be rest. I can tell you we know the strange graces that come to our aid only on a road such as this, that fly to meet us bearing comfort and strength, that come alongside us for no other cause than to lean themselves toward our ear, and with their curious insistence, whisper our name, beloved, beloved, beloved. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. I'm Kelly Walker Hart, uh, interim music director, and I use she, her pronouns. It's great to see you all this morning. Our opening song is number one in the gray hymnal, uh, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door, and it's one of the first choir videos that we worked on last fall and we so enjoyed it and the sentiment is still true. We miss you all and I hope you'll sing along with us. Number one. Of these doors lives a member of your choir. In this season of gathering, even though we can't all be together, we just wanted you to know how much we're thinking of you, that we miss you, that we love you. And we're so looking forward to the time when we can all be together outside these doors. Know that our hearts are with you. May nothing evil cross this door, and may your fortune never cry about these windows. Strong the rafters will withstand the battery of the storm. This far through all the world grown chill will keep you warm. Each 
Thank you so much to Kelly and all the choir members who were part of that beautiful, beautiful song. And I am Liza Earl Centers, Director of the Lifespan Spiritual Exploration Program at our church. I'm Lincoln. And I'm Marissa. And we are coming to you actually from Derby Line this morning. This is the house that my great grandmother lived in and um, Lydia Knight Earl and my grandfather Edwin Earl. And uh, my grandfather lived in this house for about 50 years and his time here in Derby Line was filled with community and song and spiritual journeying with the Derby Line Universalist Church. So it is so special to have our guests from the Derby Line congregation with us this morning. I know it would make my grandfather very happy to have this virtual joining of our congregation. As our family lights this chalice, we invite you to light a candle in your own homes we also invite you to join us in saying the words of our unison affirmation, which are inspired by L. Griswold Williams. Love, Love is the is doctrine, doctrine of, of this church. church. The quest, quest for, for truth, truth is its sacrament and service is its, is its prayer. prayer. To, to dwell, dwell together, together in, in peace to seek, to seek knowledge, knowledge in freedom, freedom to, to serve human need, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with, with the divine. divine. Thus do we, do we covenant. covenant. Our reading today is an excerpt from Discovering Black Vermont by Elise Guyette. We will know the world has changed when people can choose their own complex identities across racial distinctions and be treated as such. The story of this hill demonstrates that times and places of greater equality once existed in the antebellum period. However, they plunged back into valleys of injustice, and it was left up to another generation to start the long climb to regain what was lost. Such stories are often excluded from our grand historical narrative because they cannot be integrated easily into the American myth of steady progress towards liberty and justice for all. The Hills families expose the fiction of that tradi tra uh, traditional narrative and illustrate that striving for our democratic ideas is a grueling, complex, and never-ending task full of victories and defeats. 
Here ends the reading. According to the King Center, the beloved community is a term that was force coined by the early 1900s by the philosopher theologian Josiah Royce, founder of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a member of this fellowship, popularized the term and provided it with a deeper global meaning. It is a vision that all people can share in the abundance of the earth. Poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because we, with all of our human decency, will not allow it. And racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of love and humanity. Sounds good, right? A dream, a vision that became a cause and a movement, a community that we as Unitarian Universalists work toward building, the beloved community. But according to sociologist Bell Hooks, beloved community is formed not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation, by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. Not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation. Truth. For how can we build a beloved community without knowing and exploring our differences? How can we affirm what we do not know about each other or care to share or reveal or even claim our truths? Again, by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in this world. You know, everywhere I travel and have traveled, I travel extensively, um, not as much as most people, but I always look for a black community to connect with. And in most cases, the communities of color are easy to find. Historically, due to racism and discrimination, these communities have been separated and sometimes segregated, creating enclaves. Understanding the communities, including their historical formation, gives me a sense of the racial and social climate of the area, and that informs how I navigate therein. It's a shame that I have to do that. But to say the least, Vermont has been very difficult. <laughs> especially in regards to its black community. It is intriguing to find out that the black population in Vermont was larger in the 1800s than it is now. And for example, and I may be mispronouncing this, um, the city, for Virgins, and maybe Vir Virgins, um, that is a city here in Vermont, um, and the black population was 7% in 1790. 7%, whereas now it is 0.2%, according to the latest census. In fact, the towns of Bennington, Woodstock, Windsor, and Ferrisburg, along with the cities of St. Albans and Rutland, all had sizable historical black populations. What happened to these populations? Has the beloved community been achieved here in Vermont? Is that why I have difficulty finding them? Not quite. My search brought me to the scholarship of Dr. Elise Guyet. And in her 2010 work and republished last year, Discovering Black Vermont, she tells the story of three generations of free African Americans trying to build a life and community on a hill near Hinesburg, Vermont now called Liberty Hill, I mean, not Liberty Hill, excuse me, Lincoln Hill, ironically. There wasn't much to go on in reconstructing the lives and the community of the early black settlers of Vermont, just fragments of documentation, census records, tax and uh, state records, journals and discoveries of foundations and artifacts by hunters and explorers of the hill near Hinesburg but she was able to paint a picture of that legacy, 
Among her discoveries were two families, the Clarks and the Peters. According to Dr. Guyette, they settled on the hill because it got plenty of sunlight, especially at the top of the hill, which is perfect for farming. The Clark family was at the top of the hill. Shubail and Violet Clark began their family there. And the Peters settled after them, but at the bottom of the hill, which was less of a hike and easier to settle, although not as much sunlight as at the top of the hill. So Samuel Peters and Prince Peters, who we believe was Samuel's brother, perhaps, lived there at the bottom of the hill, and Prince Peters lived there with his wife, Hannah. Not only was the farming potential good, it was remote. It was isolated from the larger white Vermont during the time where Guyot writes, some people, some white people menaced their black neighbors due to racism and competition. And by the way, slavery was still present. For decades, the Clarks and the, and the Peters families prospered. They planted orchards, they raised sheep and cows, they made butter that became a hot commodity when sold to the general store in Heinsberg as they knew what they were doing, according to Guyette. They also tapped maples for syrup. And during the 1800s, their success allowed room for their families to grow. They bought more land, built more houses, and their children attended the public schools in Heinsburg and Huntington, integrating them. They became members of the Heinsburg Baptist Church, integrating it as well. The men, the black men, even voted in local and federal elections. In fact, Schubert Clark, who died in 1834, was wealthier than 70% of the region's farmers. One of the reasons why he was accepted and even served positions in the church, his offerings to the church were very prized. They survived through discrimination and prejudice as whites and blacks on both sides of the color line had to cross it in order to survive and thrive around the hill. They realized our seventh principle, the interconnected web of existence that we and all that is within the earth are a part of. Out of the sheer necessity, despite the growing racism in the nation, they created a successful black and white coalition where they not only lived and played together, but they loved and they worshiped in a biracial community in the green mountains of Vermont. History should have had its eyes on them, but they were muted. You see, the success of the Clark and Peters family did not last as farming became more industrialized and wealthy farm, wealthier farmers expanded their claims and made it harder for these black far, uh, families on the hill to compete. This illustrates the great dangers of both individualism and oppression. Loans and mortgages by the time of the Civil War were difficult to acquire for black Vermonters due to racism. White lenders had stopped loaning money to black people as part of a larger blacklash to the growing class of free black people nationally. The Peters and Clarks could not and could no longer compete and they were essentially redlined. They stopped farming. The Clarks who were at the top of the hill sold their land and moved elsewhere in Vermont. Some moved to Ohio, some moved to South Carolina even, but the Peters stayed at the bottom of the hill. No longer farmers, they worked as servants and laborers for their white neighbors. Clearly, our first principle was not realized in that region, the inherent worth and dignity of all people. The experiences with racism, white supremacy, trumped that principle. For Dr. Guyette wrote, what accounts for the muteness of these people of color in Vermont. 
One answer stems from the fact that there were, there were intermarriage between the blacks and whites on the hill. And the highly racialized climate of early America even traced even one trace of black blood would necessarily make one black, at least in the eyes of whites. Such a heritage could turn one into a permanent stranger whose very existence could be ignored. That old one drop rule. It created legal segregation in the South and perpetuated white supremacy across the nation. Blackness became synonymous with servitude, dependency, weakness, unintelligence, not worthy of citizenship, not worth much, and definitely not dignified. Whiteness became viewed as free, civilized, virile, autonomous, powerful, worthy of citizenship, and makers of history. Just one drop of black blood tainted your blood. Just one drop. She goes on to say that as a result, some African descendant people who could assert their white identity and all that it implied often hid their lineage from the following generations until all recollections of their ancestry, and I add their blackness, had vanished. Guarding this family secret became a necessity in order to sustain economic, social, and political advantages. For those who remained, their identity and cultural legacy was erased in order to assimilate into the larger white Vermont community, thereby erasing their black past and black legacy. This is not how a beloved community is formed. Again, beloved community is formed not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation. In fact, locally, Lincoln Hill goes by another name, Nigger Hill. I came across an article that told the story of cousins who were descended from the Peters family. One of the cousins was blonde and blue with blue eyes when it was discovered that her maternal ancestry came from Inward Hill. After generations of hiding their legacy, they were shamed by the, a lot of their family members and omitted from family functions. This was not a long time ago, everyone. The grandmother, who was also blind and blue-eyed as well, explained at her deathbed that growing up in Hinesburg, her classmates made her sit at the back of the bus because she was from Lincoln Hill. One of the cousins said that her father, when the truth came out, said to her, you know, had I known your mother had African-American blood in her, I never would have married her, and I would not have had kids. Racism in the area still lingers today, and this is detrimental and counteracts the building of a beloved community. Nevertheless, the cousins wanted to celebrate the early settlers, but even the historical marker has suffered from racism as it has been defaced and thrown in the Clark Family Cemetery at the top of the hill in the past 10 years. It was replaced, but this history is not even taught in the local schools. If only the inherent worth and dignity of all people was truly realized. We must live this principle in order to build the beloved community, a community in which all people can share in the abundance of the earth and protect it for love's sake, a community where poverty, hunger, and homelessness is not tolerated because we will not allow it, 
a community where all people, their uniqueness, their color, their nationality, their origins, their religious practices, their spiritualities are not eradicated but affirmed in love. A community that has no place for racism, no place for discrimination, no place for bigotry, and no place for prejudice. A community built by the all-inclusive spirit of love and humanity. Maybe they are descendants of the Clarks and Peters from the hill among us right now, whose ancestry is shaded in secrecy and shame due to white supremacy in Vermont. May you find and claim your identities and its beautiful cultural legacy. May we hold ourselves accountable for our racist past, present, and eradicate racism for our future. Through the lives and the experiences of the black families on the top and the bottom of Lincoln Hill, it is clear that building a beloved community is urgent in order to prevent the eradication of difference. May we strive to know, claim, and own the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. Today, I am proud to claim the identity of a survivor. I am proud to claim the identity of determination. I am proud to claim the legacy of resistance. It continues to shape who I am and how I live in this world. What identities and cultural legacies will you claim today? How have they shaped who you are and will shape your relationship to the earth? As we move to build this beloved community, it is my dream for this nation, for this world, that we succeed in building a beloved community in my lifetime. I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want to bask in its glory. Can I get a witness? And I want to walk in a grocery store and not have people look away as though I don't exist if they do not see me. I want you to see me. I want you to see my color. I want you to affirm me as I will affirm you because I am not ashamed of who I am. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people were created equal. We are all precious, we are all beautiful, and we are all loved. So let the power of love help us to build the beloved community and let us all live to see the day in body or in spirit. May it be so, blessed be, ashe, and amen.
Our generosity is a form of love and gratitude. Our gifts freely given help us pr to practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation. Each month through the UCM Community Pouch Program, we share part of our collection with an important church fund or a community organization aligned with our values. During the month of February, our Community Pouch recipient is Central Vermont Showing Up for Racial Justice. You can find more information about Showing Up for Racial Justice on the UCM website, in the weekly e-news, and in the order of service. Your contribution to the Community Pouch this month will directly support their work. You can make a financial contribution today by donating online. Go to ucmvt.org and click Donate to UCM. There are options to contribute to the general fund, which supports the general operating budget of the church, to the community pouch, or both. You can also mail a check to the church, or you can use our text to give option. Simply send a text message with the word give to 802-266-4848 and follow the instructions sent to you. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for your generosity in its many forms. As we draw our service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry within each of us its healing flame, the warmth of community, and the spark of hope into the days and weeks ahead. As we do so, let us join in saying the mission statement of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need, and protect the earth our home. And as we draw service to a close, um, I share these words with you from one of my mentors, the Reverend William G. Sinkford, only begun. Spirit of life and love, dear God of all nations, there is so much work to do. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy Help us hold fast to our vision of what can be. May we see the hope in our history and find the courage and the voice to work for that constant rebirth of freedom and justice. This is our dream. Amen.
across this door, and may your fortune never cry upon.